Hey guys, it's Crystal. I hope you guys are all doing well today and that everything is going good for you. I might be a little bit off today, guys. I got the COVID shot yesterday, so um, it does make me sniff a little bit. Uh, didn't appear to have any bad side effects or anything, so I suggest you get it if you do have the chance. Um, if you guys are new to this channel, like I said, my name is Crystal and I do Canadian true crime or true crime with a Canadian twist. From time to time, we do talk about other nationalities, um, particularly in the last couple of weeks, guys, we've been doing crossovers. So it's either like an offender that was born in Canada and committed crimes elsewhere or an offender that was born elsewhere and escaped to Canada or offender that was born elsewhere and murdered in several different places. Um, we're going to get into some of that. So today's case is actually where the offender was born in Canada. And I swear, I promised England we were going there. So we will be in England for part of today as well. And if you guys are returning subscribers, you guys already know how much I love you and how much I'm thankful that you guys let me come into your living rooms whenever you feel like or wherever you stream this. Um, so hopefully, guys, if this is something that's really interesting to you and you guys are new, you'll hit that old like button. Um, that's really helpful for me. You'll subscribe if you want to hear more about stuff like this. You'll hit the notification bell that might work, might not. And you'll leave me some comments. Like I always say, particularly about this case, this case has everything in it, guys. And I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't heard about this. Um, but if you guys do choose to leave comments, guys, please no hate. There's enough hate out in the world already. And we're just here to talk about things. These videos are for entertainment or educational purposes only as well. And just for you guys today, I did wear my CBC shirt. Uh, you guys already know if you've been to this channel how much I love the CBC and how much I pimp it out at every chance that I get. So today's case is about Albert Johnson Walker. And like I said, if you haven't heard of this case, I'm not surprised. It is a little now on the older side, guys, but it's got everything in it. I, I swear, this, this is a case. So Albert Johnson Walker was actually born <clears throat> August 9th of 1945. Um, not much is actually said about his childhood or anything of that extent, but he was born in Paris, Ontario. So Paris, Ontario, um, just to give you a little, I guess, information on it, guys, is actually about 30 kilometers away from Kitchener. So it's up in that area. Um, and it's about, I don't know, I think they said 13 to 16 kilometers away from, oh, it's about 12 kilometers away from Brantford, Ontario. It was actually once called the prettiest town in all of Canada. And it's a known spot for radio transmissions and for television transmissions, like for the CBC. And um, any type of radio transmission, they have a lot of um, towers in that area. But it's a pretty small place, guys. It has a population of about 12,310 people. And that was as of 2016. That was the closest census I could find. So he grew up in Paris, Ontario. Like I said, I don't really know much about his childhood, his family life, anything like that. If he has siblings, if he has parents, not much is said about things like that. There is a book, actually there's a few books on um, Albert Walker. So if you were to get those books, guys, I think that you could read a little bit more into that. I did read one, it was a long time ago, so I don't remember everything in it, but um, I don't even know if they really mentioned that much about his childhood in those in those books. Not a lot is known about it. What is known is that he did drop out of high school. So I want you guys to remember that he's a high school dropout. Um, but people remember him as, uh, especially in the community, remember him as charming, as well-dressed, very intelligent, um, highly personable great salesman. He was able to sell anything to anyone. And he did have several interesting jobs, guys. He went from job to job quite a bit. So he had jobs like being um, a managerial trainee at Zellers. Yeah, that's that's so Canadian, guys. If there's any store that was Canadian, it was that. So he had uh, the managerial training job at Zellers. Um, he worked as a cattle herder. He worked for a feed and grain business as a salesman. And he worked as a life insurance salesman. He was very, very good at that kind of thing. He was very good at selling product. He could basically sell anything to anybody. So in 1968, while he was working at 
the University of Waterloo, which is actually my alma mater, guys, if you guys will remember, that's where I went to school. He was working in the library system and he met a woman named Barbara McDonald. Barbara McDonald was actually a student at the university at the time. And the two of them started dating. Uh, it was a whirlwind relationship, guys, because they actually got married October 25th of 1968. So throughout the early... 70s and the mid 70s Albert Walker was kind of a drifter he went from job to job quite a bit now he did take some university courses at, at a couple different universities I know Waterloo was one uh, Wilfrid Laurier as well but I think there were a couple others involved too he only took about four courses so before you get excited he only took four courses I don't even know how he was able to all I can say is that it was the 70s and maybe they looked the other way this man had no high school transcripts, right? He quit high school at some point in time. So he didn't graduate. I don't know how he was able to take these courses, but he did. And these courses are interesting. There were only about four of them. Um, one of them was in um, business administration. One of them was in creative writing. One of them was a computer training course. And one of them was um, English literature, uh, uh, how to become a literary critic. So those, yeah. Those are the courses that he took. However, Albert Walker had big goals, guys. He was very ambitious. I will say that about him. He did have large goals. He dreamed big. He wanted to be wealthy. He wanted to have all the trappings of wealth. He wanted to present to people that he was a wealthy man. And he was fairly intelligent. So it seemed like these goals could be attainable, but he wasn't able to hold a job. So his family actually described it as when they'd ask him why he changed jobs so often, he would say he couldn't find the right fit. These jobs weren't good enough for him. They didn't fit his personality as well, et cetera, et cetera, things of that nature. So the family was, had very limited resources in the seventies for sure. However, it didn't stop the family from purchasing a very large house um, on the outskirts of Paris, Ontario. When Barbara and um, Albert actually originally got married, they lived in Scotland for a little while, and then they settled in her hometown of Ayr, Ontario. Uh, you guys, I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't heard of Ayr, Ontario. It's a very, very small place. There's only about 4,000 I think it was like 4,171 people that lived there and that was as of 2016. However, Air Ontario is actually pretty famous, guys. It's used to film in a lot of different movies and TV shows. Um, an episode of Murdoch Mysteries, which once again, CBC Canada, um, was filmed there. They actually used it as a backdrop for the miniseries, um, the Stephen King mini miniseries, 11 63 But it actually was also in big films. Um, Cold Creek Manor used it to film there. So did a movie called Blood and Guts. And How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, the Matthew McConaughey film. Oh my God, I can't believe it, guys. Ladies and gents, Matthew McConaughey was in Ontario and they filmed it in air Ontario parts of it um so like I said it's it's well known for that but it's a very small area so they had lived in air Ontario until 1978 and that was Barbara's hometown but air Ontario is only about 13 minutes from Paris Ontario so I mean it wasn't a lengthy move or anything they settled in a very large house in 1978 on the outskirts of Paris Ontario how he was able to afford it remains to be seen. So as of 1978, the family had grown exponentially. There was Albert Walker, Albert Johnson Walker as the father, Barbara was the mother, and then they had a daughter named Jillian in 1972. They had another daughter named Sheena in 1976. And it appears like after they made the move to Paris, they had a son named Duncan, I believe in 1979, and another daughter named Heather in 1982. It was kind of hard to pin those dates down, guys, so it would be roundabouts for that. And the family was okay. Now, like I said, Albert had some big dreams. Somehow in 1978, it appears to be 1978, he got a job as a bank teller for a trust company. So this is where I'm getting in a little bit over my head, guys. I, I'm not very good with this stuff, so hopefully I'm explaining it right. But a trust company basically just looks after the assets, property, and finances 
of clients. Um, they'll give input into it on if buying a property is a good investment or not, if they're able to afford that investment or not. He was able to get a job as a bank teller at this firm. And he lasted there for two years because during this time in 1978, he started his own, I don't know how, no high school education, no degree in accountancy, no courses in accountancy or anything like that, just business administration, if you guys remember, I don't know how, but he was able to start up his own um, ta income tax and bookkeeping business. Originally, it was for small businesses and it was called Wal Walker Financial Inc. So he started this around about 1978 when he started the bank teller job as well. And he would give advice to his clients on financial matters as well, like if something was a good investment or not. He was able to do that. I don't know how, but he was able to do that. Some sources also say that Barbara worked um, at the bookkeeping um, and income tax business as well. What is known is that sometime in... Uh, probably late 78, early 79, he acquired another income tax business from a woman uh, named Bertha Sears. And he acquired her clients at that point in time too. So he was growing his business as he went and he started to offer financial advice on things um, like mortgages and stuff of that nature to his clients as well. So he is growing this business, not sure how, but he is growing this business and business was going very well for him. People trusted him. He was a great salesman. Remember guys, he was a really good salesman that could talk anybody into anything. Uh, he was also big in the church. Um, when he and Barbara moved to Air originally, he became involved in the Knox United Church in Air. Uh, he was a youth counselor there. He taught Sunday school there. He sang in the choir there and he eventually became a church elder. So that led people to believe in him more. Number one, he's a family man. Number two, he's got this business that appears to be successful. Number three, he's involved in the church. Number four, he's a good businessman. He seems like a great guy. However, Bertha Searson remembers that even though Albert Walker did pay her, so this is red flag number one, he didn't pay her when he was supposed to every month. Eventually he would pay for um, the business, but not not when he was supposed to, not by any means. So let's red flag number one. He doesn't, he appears to have money. He's telling people he has money. He's living a wealthy lifestyle, but he's not making the payments he's supposed to when he should. He didn't have the money to acquire the business full on from Bertha Searson at that time. So he was making monthly payments until he was able to pay it off. And she says he never paid it on time. So Walker, eventually in the early 80s also started to give advice he started to present himself as a stockbroker and sell government bonds to his clients remember he was amassing a large amount of clients and people genuinely trusted him he's a church man he seems like a good guy he has children he has a wife he has these businesses that are growing seems like a great guy so people trusted what he had to say they didn't know about him buying this business from Bertha Searson. And eventually it would seem in about 1981, he actually quit his bank telling job to do this stuff full time. He was getting so many clients that he was able to do this. Um, and it was, a, of course, in the early 1980s that he started to live a really lavish lifestyle, you know, having all the accoutrements he needed, all the fine clothing, sending his kids um, to school looking very good, buying things for his family, acquiring luxury items at this point in time. So Myrtle Winter was another woman who in 19, I want to say it was about 1982. It may have been a little bit later than that. At some point in time during the early 80s or the mid 80s, she sold him her income tax and bookkeeping business as well. So he was able to grow even further. However, Red flag number two. Well, it's actually red flag number four because he's got no high school education and he never took accountancy courses. But anyway, red flag number two. He acquired this business from Myrtle Winter, but he never paid her for it, guys, at all, ever. To the point where Myrtle and her husband had to actually declare bankruptcy because he refused to pay her for that business. But he kept all this from his clients. The clients didn't know.
So after about 10 years in business, Walker Financial Inc. had grown to employ about 30, at least 30 um, employees. And they also had six central places, central hubs. And these would be in places like uh, Bramford, as far as I know. I want to say it right, guys. So just give me one second. Um, at least six different uh, branches. And these would be in places like London. These were in places like Kitchener um, and Stratford. So he was growing at an exponential rate. Now, sometime in 1982, he also formed another business, another financial business. And this one was called United Canvest Corps. It was not so much, uh, sorry guys, it was like a little fly. It was not so much like a financial business as, as a place for him to store his clients' money. And this was something he set up in the Cayman Islands. It offered, quote, considerable tax savings to his clients. So he was getting them to store their money in the Cayman Islands under this Canvest Inc. And he promised them that their money was safer and the best and safest place. Sorry guys, I just wanna say it right. He promised them that it was the best and safest place to store their money. Also, right? In Canada, they're going to tax you, but in the Caymans, it's pretty lax on taxes there, so they wouldn't be paying as much. These are large investors, guys. These are um, people with a lot of money. So he, he got them to place their money with him in the Caymans. And that's all I know about that business, guys. He may have done more in that business. That's all I know about that business. So he started that in about 1982. I know it looks like we're going back in time, but we're not. Trust me. By 1986, Albert Walker was hiding a huge secret from his clients, and I'm sure you guys have already guessed it. Though he was a great salesman and really personable, and he could sell anything to anybody, he was crap at business. He didn't take any courses in it other than business administration and some, I guess, computer training courses. He was crap at it. He didn't know how to do any of this stuff. He just thought he could get by on a wing and a prayer and I guess his own intelligence. He was an intelligent man, but he did not have a head for business and he was making high risk investments that failed. He was not, he was not putting his clients um, money in the best places that it could be. He was making these high risk deals in order to, I guess, impress upon his clients that he was able to do this well but he wasn't he just did not have a head to be able to invest in the right stocks or bonds or anything like that he inv he invested in really terrible ones um he made at least one really really bad deal in 1986 probably more than that but at least one and his business started to collapse because of this he wasn't he lost a lot of money we don't know how much money um, that was never stated, but he lost a lot of his clients' money. He still wanted to live the lavish lifestyle, though, and he still wanted people to invest, so he didn't want to let his clients know. He couldn't let his clients know. Everything would collapse on him. All of his businesses would. So Walker Financial Inc. and technically Canvest became more or less money laundering schemes and Ponzi schemes. At this point in time, he was using dividends from his new clients to pay the dividends of his other clients. No one knew at this point in time what was going on. He was able to keep this up and he was spiraling into personal debt pretty fast. However, he was still getting people to invest with him. He assured them that it was a good business and, for, and, on, and on paper, and by his way of speaking, it seemed like sound investments, but they really weren't. He had no idea what he was doing. So he was making legitimately terrible business deals at this point in time. Sorry, guys. So he lost a lot, a lot, a lot of clients' money. And in 1986, he then started to funnel the money from the Grand Cayman Islands and whatever his clients were giving him into various bank accounts. He was funneling their money into other accounts. Um, but of course, he was still getting people to invest with him. He was still, 
everything looked great on paper. Everything looked great from the outside. They had no idea that Albert Walker was making terrible business deals. He was still paying dividends to people at this point in time. There are reasons why, but he was spiraling into debt. And by 1990, not only were his businesses kind of collapsing because he couldn't keep up with what he was supposed to be paying to people, right? He had to think of other ways to do it, uh, various other schemes to do it. But his personal life, his family life was also collapsing. Uh, in May of 1990, by May for sure, he had started having an affair, several affairs from the sounds of it, on Barbara. She didn't know about it. But at, in May of 1990, he took a business trip. I'm just going to air quote it to Switzerland with one of his his girlfriends. When he came home, he actually did tell Barbara about it because he seems to have been invested in this woman. And he and Barbara then split up. However, the affair relationship didn't last for very long. And when that broke up, he tried to get back together with Barbara, but she wasn't having any of it. And this turned into a very acrimonious and messy um, separation, guys. There were squabbles about money, squabbles about everything. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind that Barbara herself had no idea that he was making these shady business deals, that he was scamming people. She had no idea he had lost money. She had no idea about any of the things that were going on. Nothing whatsoever. She didn't know that he hadn't paid people. None of that stuff. She just thought it was business as usual. Now, the courts decided that Albert Walker was supposed to pay her $30,000 a month. And this was 1990 money. That was how wealthy he presented himself to be. That he was supposed to pay her $30,000 a month for upkeep and to look after the children so they could keep living in the lifestyle they were accustomed to. Part of that is so weird to me that, that judges and lawyers do that with wealthy people. It doesn't seem like they looked very hard into his finances or anything like that. He was really able to keep it covered up. He was that smart. But I don't understand why people have to live the lifestyle they were accustomed to. They should be cutting back. But anyway, that that's just my two cents. So they were fighting about everything at this point in time. Somehow, um, they went to go see a judge about the children and who should have the children. And somehow Albert Walker was able to get custody of the oldest two children. So this would be Jillian and Sheena. He had primary custody of them. And I think he only did this so that he wouldn't have to pay so much money to Barbara. But he, he does ostensibly seem to have a an interesting relationship with Sheena. And we're going to get into that. You guys will understand. Anyway. He maintained primary custody of Jillian, who was about 19 at this point in time anyway, so she probably wasn't going to be staying living at home for that much, much longer anyway, and Sheena, who was 15 in 1990. And he uh, got primary custody of them, whereas Barbara retained custody of Duncan and Heather, who were probably about 11 and 8 at this point in time. Uh, Sheena even wrote to the judge saying that she wanted to live with her father, that she had a better relationship with him, and that basically she would have more freedom if she got to live with her father. So that was allowed. Now, unbeknownst to Barbara at this time, before the separation, and this seems like it was very, maybe even only a couple weeks before the separation, Albert Walker had taken out a $90,000 remortgage on their home. He had remortgaged their home for $90,000. And I think this was what he was using to still maintain his business, so to speak. Barbara never knew about that. Um, I think he kept the family home, guys, but I'm not totally certain about that because she never knew about that. But he had done this and he was still scheming people and everything else at this point in time. So on December 5th of 1990, Albert Walker told Barbara or left a note for Barbara saying that he was taking Sheena, just Sheena, on a two week long ski trip to Europe and that they would be back ostensibly sometime by the 19th. I think you guys have already guessed it. I'm sure you guys have already guessed what happened. Albert Walker had no intention of coming back, and we're going to get into what happened in a few minutes.
So by the end of 1990, of course, Walker and Sheena had not returned from this two-week trip. Also, his other kids must have thought that really sucked. Like, he only took Sheena. He didn't take them. Anyway, and she was, uh, Barbara was looking after the other three children at this point in time, though Jillian was 19, so I don't know how much she had to really look after her, but you guys get what I'm meaning. So at this point in time, clients had started to come forward. This would be friends. These would be family members, all people that he swindled, um, church, uh, church members, and also uh, just clients in general started to come forward saying uh, and wanted to go to the police. This was because they discovered that Albert Walker had taken large sums of money from them. And this was between July and December 4th. Between July and December 4th, he had taken at least a million dollars from various accounts. And this was of his client's monies, guys. He took this. And they had caught on by 1990. Barbara at the end of 1990, also went to the police and told them that she feared for her daughter and she believed her husband had abducted her. Now, I know that Albert Walker had custody of Sheena at this point in time, but she was supposed to be given visitations to Barbara. And of course, she's not making the visitations. She wasn't around at Christmas time. She's not around during the new year. Nothing like that. She's not around on Christmas vacation, anything like that. And Barbara wants to see her daughter. She has visitation rights and he's essentially blocking them. So police grew really suspicious of him. Um, they started an investigation into him. And they were able to ascertain that he had funneled at least $3.2 million. He had embezzled $3.2 million from his 70-some clients. Um, these would be friends, family, like I said, church associates, business associates, people of this nature. He had funneled, three point, embezzled $3.2 million from them in uh, over this period of time, at least from 1986 until 1990. Uh, 1986 being with when everything, all of the, the large and um, all of his large high risk business deals started to fall through. So this would be the Woodstock police, um, which would be the general area. They would be the major police force looking after that. This would be the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police. And this would also be the RCMP that are investigating this. Plus they're investigating where Sheena is. Now, Barbara also hired a private investigator to find Sheena. She's very worried about her daughter. She wants her daughter back. The private investigator was not able to find Sheena, but she wa he was, sorry, he was able to find out um, about the $90,000 mortgage on the Paris home that Barbara never knew about. And also that sometime in mid-1990, Albert Walker had put Sheena on birth control. His wife never knew that. And Sheena never told her either. So it's pretty interesting. So we're just, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I just got to tell you how things worked out with Barbara. So in 1992, she actually uh, filed for divorce from Albert Walker and it was granted in 1993. And in 1993, Canada charged Albert Walker with, I just want to get them right, guys. Um, um, in absentia. So of course, because he wasn't there. So he was charged with 18 counts of fraud theft and money laundering. So this was all done in his absence. We're still able to do that. And he was charged with all of this, this from the police probe and his assets and accounts that he had in Canada that they knew of were frozen at that point in time. Not that it mattered much to Walker, but what they were able to find, they froze. And in 1993, he became Canada's most wanted man. He was the most wanted man in Canada in 93. And he was number four on Interpol's internationally most wanted men. Albert Walker made number four. Some, so I'm going to say it, Wikipedia says he made number two, but that doesn't appear to be true from any of the Canadian articles I read, including the CBC, Global, the Globe and Mail, anything like this. They all say he made it to number four. So where was Albert Walker? I know you guys are wondering. I got to get into it, right? Albert Walker, two months after um, essentially fleeing Canada, he knew he was going to flee. He knew at least in 1990, he was making plans for this. He showed up in England um, as David Davis. He started presenting himself as a wealthy American man, businessman, 
named David Wallace Davis. Now, David Davis is actually the name, David W. Davis, is actually the name of one of his clients that he embezzled from, from St. Thomas, Ontario. This man never knew any of this, but Albert Walker did have all of his personal information, so he was able to do this. He showed up as David W. Davis in England. So this would be, I just want to get this right, guys, um, Harrogate, which is in North York. And Harrogate is actually uh, like a known spa area, I guess. Um, it's pretty affluent from the sounds of it. And it's a really uh, pr well-preserved vintage English town. It's also one of apparently the happiest places to be on earth. So that's just for a little little bit of info. And it's about four hours and three minutes away from London. This is where he showed up. I don't know who he was presenting Sheena as. I would guess Sheena Davis. Just, yeah, we'll get into that. So while he was there, he met a woman named Elaine Boys. She was working um, at an auction house. It seems like, like a fine art auction house. Um, yes, a she was working as a receptionist for this fine arts um, auction house in Harrogate. She was working there and they struck up a friendship. Um, she told him a lot about her life. She told him all about her boyfriend who was a TV repairman from the area, from the Harrowsmith area. Sorry, I want to make Harrogate. I always want to call it Harrowsmith. It's Harrogate. From the Harrogate area. Uh, um, and his name was Ronald Joseph Platt. She told him all about their life and all about the fact that they dreamed of one day relocating and settling in Canada. So this is very interesting to Albert Walker, a.k.a. David Davis. He's on the run. He knows police and Interpol are looking for him. He, know he's, he knows he's wanted in Canada for embezzling for sure. He knows. And he also knows that eventually people may find out that he stole the identity of David Davis. So he's using a stolen identity at this point in time. But he befriends these two people. Not only that, but he actually convinced them that he started this business. This would appear to be in 1991. He started this business called Cavendish Core, which is really interesting to me because, you know, Cavendish French fries are from Canada, right? So Cavendish Core. He started them he started this business okay and he named he offered ronald platt and elaine boys positions as directors of this company okay and all this co this company looked legit guys they they believed that they were doing business for this company and they would take business trips for this cavendish core and a lot of these business trips centered around money so he would often have them um, exchange money. Um, it, it appears to be a lot of Swiss francs into British pounds sterling for him. So they were essentially money laundering for him for those various accounts that he had with his stolen, his embezzled money in. He would have them ch exchange the money and other assets as well. They didn't know that though. They, they really did truly believe that they were the directors. Um, Ronald Platt for sure the directors of this company. Okay. So who is Ronald Platt, you guys might ask? Okay, not a lot is known about Ronald Platt either. Anytime I tried to look him up, guys, all I found out was information about Albert Walker. It appears that Ronald Platt was born in late 1944 or 1945. So he's about the same age as Albert Walker. Uh, they would have been 46 or so at this point in time in 1991. Um, and he was described as a kind, an honest, and a gentle man. Um, he was working as a TV repairman when he lived in Harrogate with Elaine Boys, but at some point in time, he had lived in Canada. Some sources say he was born in Canada. I'm not entirely certain about that. Some sources say that he lived in Canada when he was a teenager, and this was Calgary, Alberta that he settled in. What is known is that he loved Canada so much, guys, that he actually had a, a maple leaf 
tattooed on his hand because he loved it so much. And he and and he and Elaine wanted to go back to Canada and settle there permanently. This is interesting information to Albert Walker. At some point in time in 1992, his 17-year-old daughter Sheena, who's supposed to be on birth control, got pregnant. According to Albert Walker, she did not want to have this baby out of wedlock. According to him, he told her it was fine. Lots of women had children out of wedlock. Don't worry about it. But she was very, very worried and she was very upset about this. So he proposed that because a small child would be involved, he and Sheena should live life as a married couple. Sheena was supposed to become his wife. This is like bordering on, okay, I know, God, it's incest, but it's also bordering on bigamy because this is like 1991, 1992, and he wasn't divorced from Barbara at this point in time. Not that it matters, he's still living as David Davis at this point in time. And he had settled in Harrogate, or in Harrogate, I'm not sure if I mentioned that guys, but he obviously settled in that area with his good friends. So as far as I know, Ronald Platt knew her as David Davis's daughter. He needed a way to be able to present themselves as a married couple. So for Christmas of 1992, he gifted Ronald Platt and Elaine Boys one-way tickets to Calgary, Alberta, so they could go and live their dream life. It worked out well for him. Um, they appear to have left sometime in February of 1993 after, I'm, I'm guessing after they tied up all their loose ends. They appear to have left in February of 1993 to go and start their life there. Um, before they left, Albert Walker convinced Ronald Platt to leave behind his birth certificate, a credit card, um, his signature stamp, right? Because he would just stamp his signature when he was approving business documents. And also, um, just give me one second. Oh, his driver's license. He also was able to convince Ronald Platt to leave these behind. It was 1990, guys. So, I mean, as long as you had a passport, you didn't have to worry so much about this stuff. Border patrol was more lax at that point in time. Um, and flights were more lax at that point in time, too. So he convinced him to leave it behind and Ronald Platt did. He left it all behind. And essentially, as soon as he was on that plane, Albert Walker shed his David Davis persona and became Ronald Joseph Platt. His wife, his daughter, became his wife, Noelle Platt. And when Sheena's daughter was born in 1993, she listed the baby's father as Ronald Platt and she gave him the last name or she gave her, sorry, the last name of Platt as well. Yes. Essentially, Albert Walker wanted to be rid of Ronald Platt and Elaine Boyce, A, before they could find out that the business he was running was, was just a facade. B, before they could out him, as David Davis. They knew him as David Davis, but I mean, at this point in time, Interpol's kind of, you know, heavily searching. And he was probably afraid he could be found out about that. But also, he wanted to present himself and his daughter, his daughter, as man and wife. Now, um, I'm just going to show you a picture, guys. Just give me one second. I know, it's really convoluted. I know, I'm trying. So this right here, hopefully you guys can see it. I know it's fairly small. Sorry, guys. This right here would be Albert Walker and Sheena together. So that's both Albert Walker and Sheena. And I believe, if you guys will just give me one second. Yeah, here's another picture of the two of them together. And that's probably from the time when they were living as man and wife. 
So he stayed in contact with Elaine boys and with uh, Ronald Platt, obviously, because he needs to know where they are. If they come back to England, he's living as Ronald Platt. So he needs to keep tabs on them. Um, he and Sheena actually then moved to Essex, which is a, um, even a more affluent place in uh, England. And I just want to give you guys some time. Um, Deepesh Mode and The Prodigy actually came from this county. It's a county in England. So this is Essex County. We actually have an Essex County here too. Um, it's... Um, where Leamington is. Leamington, Ontario is in Essex County. So we also have one here in Canada. Um, so it's another affluent place. Uh, like I said, Depeche Mode and, and bands like The Prodigy came from there. And um, it's about 61 kilometers from London, if that helps you guys out. Uh, so Sheena had her baby, as far as I can tell, in 1993. Uh, maybe late 92, early 93, but it sounds like it was early, early 90, 1993. She became pregnant again sometime in 1995 while she and her father are living as husband and wife. She became pregnant again. She'd probably be about 19 years old at that time. Regardless, this baby was subsequently born Ronald Platt is listed as the father, and this baby's last name is also Platt. At this point in time, if you guys remember, Albert Walker is Ronald J. Platt, and she is Noelle Platt. At some point in time, Albert found out that, um, from Elaine, because he was in contact with her, that she um, had left Ronald Platt for whatever reason. It doesn't seem to be acrimonious or anything. Um, she just become disillusioned, I guess, and she left and came back. I don't know when she came back, but she did come back to England. Sorry, guys, just one second. By 1995, Ronald Platt had also become disillusioned with Canada. Not so much with the, the, the country itself, but more or less with the fact that financially he just wasn't able to make it in Canada. So by 1995, he moved back to England. This is a huge problem for Albert Walker, but he did a little dance for a while. And what's interesting to note is that Ronald Platt actually settled not that far from where um, Noel and the other Ronald Platt lived in Essex County. He settled not that far from them. In fact, David, da okay. In fact, Albert Walker as David Davis gave him, yeah, because he still had to pretend he was David Davis for these guys. He gave him a letter of reference so that uh, Ronald Platt could uh, um, find lodgings. So they actually didn't live that far from each other. But this is a huge problem for Ronald Platt, for Ronald Platt, to have the real Ronald Platt there. Huge problem. He knew he could be outed. Ronald J. Platt is the one man that could definitely out Albert Walker. He could go to the police and say, look, this guy's been using my um, identity for years at this point in time. I know him as David Davis. Well, type in David Davis. Okay, he shows up, but so does David Davis, who was a client that Albert Walker embezzled from. And this way, his real personality could be found out. At this point in time, he's been on the run for years. So he needs to get rid of Ronald Platt. They were able to coexist somehow for a few months without people finding out, without Ronald Platt finding out that he was using his identity. And on July 20th of 1996, so at this point in time, Sheena and Albert had been on the run for six years. He lured him onto his yacht. Um, there are a couple different stories about how he got him there. But he was able to. Some said that it was like uh, he lured him out there uh, for a fishing trip. Some said that uh, it, it appeared to be some type of like a family trip to Devon where their good friend Ronald Platt was going to go along with him and uh, Noel. And so she may have been known as Noel Davis. I'm not sure. And the two girls. Uh, they were not involved. They were not on the ship. It was just Walker, or sorry, the yacht. It was just Walker and Platt that were there. Some people said that he he wanted Ronald Platt to help him with maintenance on the boat. Regardless, it doesn't matter. He was able to get him on this yacht called the Lady Jane. And about four miles, which would be about 6.61 kilometers from shore, he actually took um, an anchor, a 4.5 pound anchor, and hit Ronald Platt on the back of the head. 
has caused a large gash, guys, and it knocked him unconscious, but he wasn't dead. He then tied the anchor to Ronald Platt's belt and threw him overboard. Now, nobody was around. Nobody witnessed this. Nobody saw it. But he did throw him overboard. Um, he was happy, right? Essentially, the, the real Ronald Platt is gone. Now, he may have thought that by weighing him down, he either A, would sink to the bottom of the English Channel and not be found uh, ever, or that he would just be, you know, floating down and, and go out into the ocean at some point in time. doesn't matter, but whatever his thought process was, he was pretty happy because he can continue being Ronald Platt. The real Ronald Platt is dead. However, on, Ju on July 28th of 1996, uh, a commercial fisherman named John Kopek, C-O-P-I-K, so Kopek or Kopek, um, found a body. This was lodged in his fishing nets in the English Channel. There was no marks on this body other than... Um, the huge gash in the back of his head. And despite this, when police came for the body, they thought this person had committed suicide. They thought they were dealing with a suicide by drowning. Maybe they thought they the guy hit himself in the back of the head and uh, had, had committed suicide, had thrown him. I, I really don't know, but they considered it a suicide. It didn't matter though. They still needed to find out who this man was because then that way they could notify his family. The actual Ronald Platt was never uh, reported missing until six weeks after he actually went missing. So they had no idea that a Ronald Platt was missing at this point in time anyway. They just needed to find out who this man was. However, this man had no identification on him. Um, his clothes were, were pretty generic and there were no ID. The only thing he had on him was a Rolex watch. Now, Rolex watches, guys, are investment timepieces. We know this. They're very, very costly. They also have a serial number on the back of them, and certain engravings are put on them every time somebody has it serviced or repaired. So police figured they could find out this man's identification or ID by looking into the records, matching up the serial number and checking repair logs. And this watch had been repaired at least once and it seems to have been repaired at least 10 years prior. Remember, there are certain engravings they put on to show that it has been uh, repaired in some way. And through the watch, guys, through the watch, they were actually able to identify this man. And of course, we know it was Ronald Joseph Platt. They were also able to establish uh, a date of death um, because, or about the, the time that he went into water, because the watch is waterproof for up to two days, at least up to two days, even when fully submerged. The calendar, it had a calendar, so the calendar can still work and the watch can still work for at least two days after entering the water. So they were able to approximate his time of death as July 20th. However, the real Ronald Platt still was not reported missing for six weeks after this, but it, it took them some time to figure out who this man was and his ID. So they still needed to find his family or at least get a hold of somebody. And what they did find when they were checking into records on Ronald Platt was this letter of reference given to him by David Davis. So they went to go and speak to David Davis. They were able to find his cell phone number and in 1996, guys, you gotta have quite a bit of money or I mean, obviously he embezzled quite a bit of money anyway, but you have to have quite a bit of money in order to have a cell phone. But they were able to find his cell phone number and of course they contacted David Davis and as soon as they asked for David Davis, he became David Davis again. And uh, he told police, oh yeah, I'll come down to the station. He went to the station. He seemed like a nice man. He was very forthcoming with information. And he basically told them that he hadn't seen Ronald Platt for a while. And the last thing he knew was that Ronald was going off to France. And he figured he was all well and good with the police. Everything was done for. He could still, they knew him as David Davis. They didn't know that he was living as Ronald Platt. Um, police just wanted to clear up a few other things with him, probably ask more about his relationship with Ronald Platt just to get more information on this man. So they went to his house. They went to the David Davis house. The Davises were not there. 
however a neighbor was. And when they, they asked the neighbor, you know, if they knew what time David Davis would be home or about his, his daily meanderings, I guess, the neighbor said, there's no David Davis that lives here. The person that lives here is Ronald Platt and his family. And they're like, wait a second, how can Ronald Platt live here, but be in our morgue? And he also was able to tell them that Ronald Platt had a yacht. So at this point in time, police put two and two together and they figured they had a murder investigation on their plan, uh, on their hands. So they arrested David Davis at his home on October 31st of 1997. They were able to link things up. How can you be Ronald Platt, but also David Davis, right? And also you have a yacht and we found the real Ronald Platt. So obviously they arrested him. When they arrested him on the day they were arresting him, he was still going around as Ronald Platt, but they found Sheena, Noelle Platt, in another room stuffing gold bars into uh, a diaper bag. So the jig was up at this point in time. So, sorry, this case though, guys, I do want to remind you was entirely circumstantial. Yes, they knew that Albert Walker had stolen uh, this identity. And at this point in time, they knew he was Albert Walker. They were able to find that out, linking up pictures and everything else. And that he was a really wanted man in Canada and on Interpol. And they had his fingerprints. So they knew he was wanted. Um, but this case for murder was entirely circumstantial. Um, the only thing that linked it together was the fact that um, one of Ronald um, Platt's fingerprints were found on a plastic bag aboard the Lady Jane. One of his fingerprints were found there, so they knew he had been on the boat at least once. And GPS from the boat were, was able to show them that on uh, July 20th, Albert Walker's boat was in the same area that Ronald Platt had been drowned in, so to speak. So they were able to link that up that way. However, nobody had seen the two men together for at least eight, uh, 10 days prior to the real Ronald Platt's disappearance or to the real Ronald Platt's murder. And um, they also, uh, sorry guys, there were no eyewitnesses, like I said, to the murder. There was no one around. So there were no other ships around. He, he was pretty smart when he did this. So this case is entirely circumstantial at this point in time. Um, on April 27th of 1998, Albert Walker pled not guilty to the murder of Ronald Platt. He basically said, yes, I'm a thief. Yes, I'm a swindler. Yes, I lie, but I would never kill my good friend, Ronald Platt. He was just too good of a friend to me. Um, 32 witnesses were actually called to the stand, including the Crown Star witness, Sheena Walker, a.k.a. Noelle Platt. Um, she said she had, quote, been hypnotized by Walker, end quote, and that he was evil. Um, she was questioned about the paternity of the two daughters she had while being Noelle Platt. And she would never give any information on that. Not that I guess it mattered. It was a murder case. It wasn't about um, who the father of these children was. And it is still unknown, guys. They She still refuses to talk about that. So it does make you suspicious as to who the dad is. If you get my meaning. Um, regardless. She also refused to answer many questions about her married life with Walker. She kind of skirted over that. She didn't really mention a whole lot about that. And of course, um, they did ask her about the fact that she became Noelle Platt and that the uh, birth certificates had Ronald J. Platt as their father, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, of course, he couldn't be for at least one of them because he was obviously in Canada at that point in time. But regardless, she was questioning about it. She wasn't very forthcoming about it. She just described her father as this evil con man. And of course, Walker took the stand and yes, I'm a liar. Yes, I'm a thief, but I would never murder anybody. I don't need to do that. He also refused to answer questions pertaining to the, the parentage of the two children and about his married life with his daughter. Um, he said that he never intend, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Sheena said, quote, my father suggested that because there was a small child, we should present ourselves as a couple, end quote. 
And that is all she said about that. Um, of course, Albert Walker um, said on the stand that initially he never wanted to take his daughter to England with him, but she uh, begged and pleaded so much that he gave in. And he also said at that point in time that the only reason why he married his daughter was to make these children legitimate because she was so worried about it. That's what he said. So obviously he was found guilty. Um, and it was only two hours of deliberations that the jury took, guys. He was found guilty and this would be on July 6th of 1998 and he was sentenced to life in the English prison system, which is a lot like the Canadian prison system. Life doesn't necessarily mean life. So Sheena and the two girls at this point in time went back to uh, Canada and lived with her mother in, in Paris, Ontario at that point in time. Um, police were able to get back $500,000 worth of the money he'd stolen. Um, they auctioned off various assets um, from the house in England. This would include oil paintings, gold bars, because he had been amassing large amounts of gold bars um, throughout that past year. And also the sale of the Lady Jane. Yeah, somebody bought the boat that Ronald Platt was murdered on. So they were able to, to recover at least $500,000 um, worth of money. That's a far cry from the $3.2 million they knew he stole. And it's never been established, guys. Never, ever, ever. It's never been established how much money because he won't admit to it. He won't admit to being guilty in the murder of Ronald Platt. He keeps saying he's innocent of that. And he also uh, won't admit to how much money he actually stole or how much money he actually lost. Nobody will admit to that. So Walker had opened at least 25 accounts in various people's names, probably some under David Davis, um, several under the names Ronald Platt, several under Elaine Boy's names too, all without them knowing it. He had at least 25 accounts. And these bank accounts were in various places like Switzerland, France, England, and the Cayman Islands. So he filtered a lot of money and essentially he was able to get away with it for quite some time. Um, a Judge Neil Butterfield, I love that name, Butterfield. Judge Neil Butterfield in England, um, this was in uh, Exeter um, that, that the trial took place, said at the conclusion of the trial, quote, this killing was carefully planned and cunningly executed with chilling efficiency, end quote, and quote, you are a plausible, intelligent, and ruthless man who poses a serious threat to anyone who stands in your way, end quote. So Elaine Boys was, of course, very happy with the verdict at the end of the trial, and she said, quote, for his life, Ronald Platt's life, uh, to end in this tragic way by a so-called friend whom Ron and I felt at ease with and trusted as well. I cannot find the words to express that horror, end quote. So, yeah, there's more. Uh, on February 22nd of 2005, um, Albert Walker was extradited back to Canada. Of course, we have an extradition treaty with England and there's no death penalty, so nothing stands in the way. He was extradited back to Canada to stand trial for his uh, theft, money laundering, and fraud um, charges here in Canada. And he actually wanted to be extradited back to Canada. He was good with this because he wanted to be closer to his family. Um, anyway, he had to answer the charges for that in this country. And there was a 2005 interview done with Sheena at that point in time, in which she said Albert Walker was, quote, an evil con man, like she said before, who had, quote, manipulated me and lied to me just like everyone else, end quote. She actually said she wished her father was still in England and rotting in jail in there so she'd never have to deal with him again. She didn't want him back in Canada. She said he still posed a serious threat um, to her family and her children's safety. And she also said she needed to protect her family from him. Um, she also said that when she was a teenager and a child, her father had almost complete control over her whole entire life. And um, 
that she didn't want to have any more contact with him. Um, she hadn't had any contact with him since the trial. And as far as I know, guys, she's never had any further contact with him at all. She said she did not want to be involved in that. And once again, she refused to talk about the children's um, heritage, which is up to her. I mean, I think at this point in time, we can probably ascertain who their father was. But regardless... In July 22nd of 2007, Walker was sentenced in Kingston to four and a half years to be served concurrently. And this was only for, um, for the fraud that he committed. I guess they, they couldn't find anything on the money laundering or the theft. I'm not sure. They just got him for four years or sorry, four and a half years for the fraud and one year for uh violations of the bankruptcy and insolvency uh, insolvency sorry guys act in canada and these were of course to be served concurrently but on top of the life uh sentence for the murder which had been extradited to canada as well this carries over from england into canada we are part of the commonwealth technically speaking. So it carried over here. So he's still serving the life sentence for the murder of Ronald Platt. But on top of that, he's also serving time um, for uh, for fraud and for the, um, the violations of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. So he's serving that time. He served time, uh, of course, in Kingston Penn uh, until 2013 when they shut down Kingston Penn. And then he was transferred to somewhere in BC. He has come up for day parole from time to time, as far as I can tell. Um, I know it was actually in 2013 he came up um, for day parole. I haven't heard anything about that. As far as I know, and as far as everyone else knows, he is still serving time in prison in BC. He's going to be 76 years old at this point in time, but the judge and even I still think that it doesn't matter if you're 76 years old. This guy is a consummate con man. If he was let out, he would try it again. And he still poses a risk to his family. So at this point in time, it's unknown exactly where he is, just that he's apparently at a prison somewhere in BC still serving his time. For all intents and purposes, that's all we know. Um, he doesn't appear to be in poor health. That's where the story ends. And that's it, guys. That's it. That is the... That is the case of Albert Walker. Like this case had everything. This had con on, this had a con man on the run. This had greed. This had various frauds. This was a scammer's paradise. Uh, this had incest in it. This had murder in it. This, this had everything. This had affairs. This had technical bigamy in it. It was everything. So if you haven't heard of this case, now you finally have. Albert Walker is he is a very interesting man. So I guess you guys know that I usually follow up with some questions. So what do you guys think? Do you think that Albert Walker still poses a risk to the public? I, I certainly do. I, it's a, I, this guy is so, has been doing it for so long that I'm sure he, he still believes if he ever is to get out, if, if he doesn't die in prison, that he, he would probably go on to con people. Um, what do you think made him do this to begin with? I mean, obviously he murdered, he murdered Ronald Platt to cover up his own, his own lies and deceits. And he didn't want to be found out by Canada. He wanted to avoid prisons at all costs. So that way he could still live his luxurious life. But what do you think made him do it? Do you think, uh, as far as I know, he's never been diagnosed with anything. So it seems like it was just greed that made him do this. What do you guys think? What do you guys think of Sheena? Do you think she had any involvement? I do want to remind you, she was a 15-year-old girl when her dad took her. She said he controlled most parts of her life. He put her on birth control. Do you think he had been molesting her for years? It's highly possible. And that she was completely under his spell? It's possible, guys. Especially the birth control thing. He knew he was going to go on the run. It seems like he knew he was going to be taking Sheena too. Even though he said she begged and pleaded with him. I mean, he knew, he knew he was going on the run when he took that trip. That was ostensibly why he did it. So what do you think of that? Do you think that her father manipulated her into this? She was found stuffing gold bars into that diaper bag. She did go along with being Noelle Platt. She never went to the police about that. She did accept. She knew about all the cons, right? She knew about the frauds, at least with insofar as what he had done under the name David Davis and under the name Ronald Platt. She probably didn't know about the defrauding of Canada. I, I don't, 
I don't know. She claims her her father never confided anything in her. So I don't know, guys. Um, I think I think more than likely she was just a pawn in this and that he, he seriously did manipulate her. But who's to say for sure? When he was arrested, it does look like she was stuffing those gold bars to either A, hide them so she could finance things, or B, so they could go on the run again. I don't know. And of course, I do have to ask, who do you guys think the father of her children is? I mean, it's, I guess it's really none of our business, but it's one of those those questions that constantly float around about this case. To be honest with you guys, I, I really do think the father or fathers of her children is Albert Walker. That's why they probably stay so tight-lipped about it. I mean, if she wanted to vindicate that part of herself, she would probably have been the first to say, oh, no, 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 we lived as man and wife, but he was not the father of my babies. This person was, or these people are. But maybe she did it too to protect her children against questioning. Regardless, we'll probably never know who her baby's daddy is, daddies are. Anyway, so that's it, guys. That is it for the case. Leave me some comments down below on what you guys think of this case or if you've ever heard of this case or if I've left anything out, guys. I'm not very good with financial stuff. That is that is the end point for me. I'm, I'm good at some parts of math, but not that stuff that goes over my head. So just let me know, guys, what you guys think down below. And please come back again next week. Hopefully you guys, please, please, please will like, like, like these videos. Um, you know, hit the like button on any of them if you haven't before. Hopefully you'll subscribe if you already haven't um, and and stay for more. Um, if you guys haven't checked out other videos, there's there's a lot more out there. Um, I've done Bernardo and Hamoka. I did the village murders, um, disappearances, anything like that. If you guys haven't checked them out, feel free to do so. Hit the notification bell. That might work, might not. And like I said, leave me some comments, guys. I'd love to hear your opinions on this one. Hopefully, you guys will have a good week, a safe week. If you haven't got the COVID shot and you can do it, I urge you to do so. It's one step closer to us maybe retaining some form of normality again. And I hope to see you guys back here next week where we can talk about another crossover crime. So until then, bye for now, guys.